let's make snake macarons. Macaron. Ma ma those French cookies. We're going to make snake ones. <laughs> doo 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 doo. Cookie smut. So yes, hi, my name is Shauna, aka Cookie Smut. I make videos about baking and crafts. If that sounds fun, please subscribe. Today we are making snake macarons, is how I'm going to say it for the rest of the video. We are making a plain snake shaped cookie with a pistachio buttercream and a super cute royal icing tongue. Okay, so full disclosure that this video is going to be a lot of do as I say, not as I do, because I am by no means a macaron making expert. I make so many mistakes. In fact, I tried to make two different batches, so two whole sets of mistakes. And even though if I were on the Great British Bake Off, Paul Hollywood would absolutely tear me apart. These still end up looking cute and tasting great, so I'm going to share them with you anyways. And in fact, maybe you'll learn from my mistakes. First things first, I sift together the almond flour and the powdered sugar. A lot of people say to sift these together three times, but as a person who hates sifting at all, once is enough for me. Next, I set up my double boiler because today we are going to be making the Swiss meringue variation of macarons. So I take my pot of water, just a couple of inches, I bring it to a boil and then pull it back down to about medium low, like a nice healthy simmer. Next, whisk together the egg whites and granulated sugar and heat that over the double boiler. Do keep whisking this mixture the entire time to make sure that the egg whites don't cook, but don't worry, we won't be here long. We want to heat this mixture up until about 150 degrees. If you don't have a thermometer, you can dip a finger in and rub a little bit of the mixture between your fingers. You should no longer be able to feel the sugar. It should be dissolved in the egg whites and it should be kind of hot. <laughs> This step yields a much more stable meringue, which as a person with a not super great history with meringues, I really, really want when making the notoriously finicky macarons. Then start whipping those bad boys up, gradually adding in the rest of the sugar. If you're adding food coloring, you can also do that during this portion of the program. Just remember that whatever color you see in the bowl right now is going to lighten up not only during the whipping process, but also after adding in the dry ingredients. This, my friends, is my mistake number one. My color was way too light. Then just keep whipping until you have stiff, glossy peaks. When you lift the beater out of the bowl, the peak should stand completely straight up, no little curl over. Next, it's time for macronage, which is a word that literally means this next step of making macarons. I don't know why. This is my second mistake. What I did was take a little bit of my meringue and add it into my almond flour and powdered sugar mixture, which to be fair to myself is a step that happens in a lot of different kinds of recipes. What I should have done for this recipe is sprinkle in the dry ingredients into the meringue. What I do here is going to cause me lots of lumps and lots of problems. If you've heard anything about how to make macarons, you've probably heard be careful not to overmix it. But it's not just that, it's also possible to undermix it. So it's all about hitting that exact sweet spot for the mixture. And you know, we took all that time to whip up all of the air into the meringue. After we add in the dry ingredients, we then gotta beat that air back out of it by mixing and mixing until it deflates to just the right level. The most common test and the one that's gotten me the closest to success is to use the figure eight or ribbon test. Your mixture should be just runny enough that when you grab some up onto your spatula, you can draw a figure eight with it. For this batch, by the time I started getting to that ribbon stage, I still had quite a few lumps in my batter and I decided to prioritize stopping mixing at the ribbon stage as opposed to getting rid of all of the lumps, which I think was the right choice, but it does mean that as I'm piping, you'll see some lumpage. Now it's time to talk snakes. So I have been really into drawing this kind of overhead silhouette kind of view of a snake. I already had a reference on my iPad on Procreate ready to go, but I decided that I also wanted to vectorize it in Illustrator. That's certainly not necessary if you want to do something like this as well, um, but I am going to need the vector image for other projects that I want to do later on, so I decided to do it right now. I was able to take that image and just print out a template with that image repeated that I can put underneath my parchment paper or my silicone mat to help me pipe. 
and uh, I will provide that template for you down below if you want to use it as well. Now on to the piping. Piping was yet another mistake on this first batch. Um, two things kind of went wrong. Number one wasn't so much a mistake, but sort of a natural part of experimenting and doing something that I've never really done before, which is pipe quite an intricate shape with macaron batter. I didn't really know how much space to leave in those little negative spaces in that like S curve of the snake's body. I was worried that if I left too big a hole, then the cookie might not be structurally sound. And I thought maybe I should sort of make the snakes a little bit chunkier and make the S's kind of smoosh into each other and that would provide a stronger cookie. But in the end, I think I sacrificed too much of the definition of the snake. And the more svelte snakes that I piped in this first batch actually held up totally fine in terms of structural integrity. So yeah, um, I kind of made a little bet on which way to go and I got it wrong and that's okay because I've literally never done this before. The other thing that plagued me during the piping process was the batter itself. Not only did those lumps kind of clog up in the tip of my piping bag, but also even though I did the figure eight test, my macaron batter was still a little bit stiff. I could have mixed it even more, deflated it even more. As I was piping, there were still like ridges left in the shape that weren't settling naturally on their own. I had to come in with my X-Acto blade and smooth it out. Macaron batter at the right consistency should, if any like sort of bumps or ridges are on the surface of your cookie, they should settle on their own naturally. Otherwise, it's too stiff. So then the macarons have to sit and dry out for half an hour before going into the oven. So while they were drying and baking, I worked on my pistachio buttercream, which I had the incredibly wise idea to make from scratch. The first step of which was to make pistachio paste. And I thought, if I'm going through all the trouble to make pistachio paste, why not make a crap ton of it? Yet another wise and definitely not incredibly time consuming idea. <laughs> Uh, so, if you want to make your own pistachio buttercream, starting with pistachio paste, which I actually think is a totally reasonable thing to do because it is incredibly delicious, I recommend instead of shelling, then blanching, and then peeling that papery skin off of the pistachios yourself, to find pre-blanched, pre-shelled pistachios. If you can't find them in your local grocery store, order them online. It's worth your time to not do it yourself. Trust me on this. Then to make the paste, just whiz that up in the food processor with just enough water to get it going. Then we use that to make a pretty straightforward American butter cream. First, you whip up the butter and the pistachio paste until it is light and fluffy, then add your powdered sugar. Again, the recipe says to sift, but I don't sift if I don't think I really, really need to. So just throw that powdered sugar in there. You're gonna beat it enough that you really don't need to sift it. Simple American pistachio butter cream. I will link the recipe that I started with down below, but the second time that I made it, I upped the amount of pistachio paste by another half, and I highly recommend doing that. It was so much more flavorful. Mm, so good. I also did cheat and added a little bit of food coloring to my first batch of buttercream. After the cookies came out of the oven and were completely, completely cooled, I inspected them to see just how they turned out. And this is when I finally sort of accepted that I made the wrong choice and I should have done all of them in the skinnier way with bigger spaces. Yeah. <laughs> also the lighter neon green that I went with compared to that darker green from my original sketch meant that the cookies picked up a tiny bit of brownness in the oven and that browning mixed with the neon green just really didn't look good to me. My number one thing that I struggle with with macarons is them being hollow. And on this batch, the cookies that were on the outermost edge of the tray had the most hollows. So I think between the browning and the hollows on the outside, maybe my oven was a little too hot. And so 
I haven't done enough research, but I think the heat on the outer edges being higher maybe caused the hollowing to happen. But I still sandwiched them up and gave them to some friends, uh, even without any further decoration. I stopped here and didn't decorate any further because I already knew I was going to redo them. So on to batch number two. So for batch number two, I made my Swiss meringue off screen in my actual kitchen with my actual stand mixer. And you can see that I did in fact make it darker. On the positive side, I did not make any of the same mistakes on batch number two. On the negative side, the one new mistake that I did make was so, so, so much worse in terms of the, the technical aspects of the macaron. Like, the only reason why the first batch didn't get last in the technical challenge is because this batch would have placed beneath it. Another nice thing though is that they ended up looking much better. So since I'm mostly judged by Instagram and not Paul Hollywood, it's all good. Uh, they're definitely gram worthy. On batch number two, I mixed the ingredients correctly. I made it the right color. I piped them beautifully, if I may say so myself. So where did I go wrong? Well, I actually went wrong already before this part of the video started. It was in making that Swiss meringue that I made off camera. I think because I switched back to my stand mixer, I just overbeat it. So it's a little hard to tell from the video, but Swiss meringue should be glossy and like sticky and thick. And I took it to the point where it kind of became a little bit dried out. So it kind of looked like foaming hand soap instead of you know thick candy deliciousness and that is what's gonna cause all the problems that you will see very shortly okay so I already lied to you I'm so sorry I did make a couple other mistakes including one repeated one one mistake was that I let my first tray of snakes dry too long I took a dinner break in between piping the first and second tray and that is how I learned that it is possible to over dry your macarons and I'll show you what happens later the other mistake is a repeat and it is that I still did not mix my, I did not do my macronage uh, enough still and my mixture was still a little bit too stiff while I was piping the first tray. But again, letting the bag kind of sit there while I ate dinner meant it deflated a little bit. So my second tray looks gorgeous and was definitely the perfect consistency for nice smooth cookies for that second tray. Alright, it's time to look at the carnage. <laughs> so this is my first tray and it is super super cracked and that I believe is the result from the over drying when I flip them over you can see that they are also pretty freaking hollow the entire bottom of the cookie is more of like a mesh than a solid cookie but if you thought that looked hollow just wait until you look at tray number two <laughs> Oh, oh no. Some of the snakes in the center here were, they were so hollow that they actually weren't even hollow anymore because they actually didn't even have the bottom anymore. So instead of a hollow cookie, it was just the top shell of a cookie. <laughs> and I think there are two factors here. Number one is again just that overbeaten meringue. The second thing is I'm using a silpet here and in addition to that I also forgot to remove the paper template from in between the sil silpet and the tray. And the silpet already is a little bit thicker than parchment paper and therefore is a little bit more insulating. Then on top of that, that extra piece of paper in between, I think meant that this tray was just underbaked on the bottom and just in general baked real, real wonky. Oh, and also this entire batch had pretty much zero feet to speak of. But as I said, only Instagram can judge me and these babies look super smooth and great on top. So we're going to continue with decoration which also plagued me. <laughs> First of all, I was watching Bridesmaids at the time and I was so distracted by how bad the baking scenes are in Bridesmaids that I 
lost track of what I was doing and I went ahead and filled and sandwiched these cookies before I decorated them, which I do not recommend doing. It makes everything so much harder. Don't do what I did. Don't do it. Pay attention. Don't get distracted by Kristen Wiig's character being the world's worst fake baker. So my original sketch had stripes and dots on all of the little snakes, so I pulled out some royal icing to do those decorations, but as soon as the stripes went on the first cookie, I just did not like it at all. So then I had to haphazardly wipe off that royal icing. I don't have footage of it, but I also tried painting on the stripes and the dots, and I also tried piping just the dots, and just none of it was looking right, so I decided to keep it simple. These snake bodies are already so much more defined than the first batch, but I took some edible paint and added some shading to give their bodies even more clarity. Then I just paint on some little eyes. Then on a cookie bag, I pipe the tongues as royal icing transfers. So I just piped out a variety of shapes of tongue way, way, way more than I'm going to need in case any of them break. And then I just let that dry overnight. And then when they are completely dry, they pop right off of that plastic and are now essentially custom sprinkles that you can stick into the snake's mouth, uh, into the buttercream filling, and the snakes are done. If you are going to try these and serve them at a party or something, I would recommend not sticking the tongues into the buttercream until the very last moment before you serve, just because they are pretty delicate. And if you try and, I don't know, move them a lot or arrange them a lot when the tongues are already placed, you're going to have a greater chance of that tongue just breaking off. And here they are. <laughs> These were a slog to make and they look pretty different from how I sketched them out. Um, they're a lot more plain, but I think the overall effect of them all together, you know, all on a plate or on my $4 Ikea cutting board together is still really effective. It wasn't until I put the tongues in that I really felt satisfied. <laughs> and I also pulled out a plate that I painted at one of those um, paint it yourself ceramics place. I thought they would look cute on the kind of tropical feel and I love it you know the harder earned the wins are the prouder you are of them thank you so so much for watching please subscribe for more baking crafting and actually more snakes um, and I will see you next week pistachios blanching in a boiling pot <laughs> I don't want to do this anymore. I think I should have blanched them longer.